Ladies and gentlemen, George Orwell once said that the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. More than nine decades ago, a daughter of Polish Jewish immigrants by the name of Rhea Kleiman departed Toronto on a mission for the Toronto Telegram to explore the workers' paradise of the Soviet Union. But instead of finding a promising new frontier, she stumbled upon the worst state-imposed famine in her lifetime. And she became the first Western journalist to report openly on the mass starvation sweeping Ukraine and the ugly realities of life under Joseph Stalin's dictatorship. Expelled by the Soviets for, ex for her exposés, she was Orwell's inconvenient truth teller of her time. 90 years after the Holodomor genocide, thanks to her bestseller, Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, we recognize that it was historian and writer Anne Applebaum who gifted our generation It was Anne Applebaum who gifted our generation with the definitive truth-telling book on the Holodomor, a crime whose consequences still resonate today. Born in Washington, D.C., after graduating from Yale University, Anne Applebaum was a Marshall Scholar at the London School of Economics and St. Anthony's College in Oxford. In addition to being a staff writer for The Atlantic, she has been a contributor to Foreign Affairs, The New Republic, and The New York Review of Books. A Washington Post columnist for 15 years, she has also held senior positions as a writer and editor at several leading British magazines and newspapers. From 1988 to 91, she covered the collapse of communism as the Warsaw correspondent for The Economist. The recipient of over 20 awards, prizes, and state honors, Anne received the Pulitzer Prize in 2004 for her book, Gulag, A History. Both Gulag, A History, and her book, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, have been translated into two dozen languages. And Anne's recent New York Times bestseller, Twilight of Democracy, which everyone will be receiving tonight, was just translated in Ukrainian, and we have a limited number of Ukrainian language copies as well to pick up when you leave. In 2021, Ann Applebaum was awarded the International Center for Journalists Excellence in International Reporting Award. That same year, she was presented with the 38th Francisco Cerecedo Journalism Award awarded by King Felipe VI of Spain. In 2022, Ms. Applebaum was invited to testify before the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee on issues on, related to combating authoritarianism and its propaganda. Anne is married to the member of the European Parliament for Poland, soon to be, we hope, sworn in as Foreign Minister of Poland, Radoslaw Sikorski. And when her international commitments don't have her traveling between Washington and London, they spend time in their country home in Chobielin, Poland. One of the most consequential undertakings in which Ms. Applebaum is currently involved is the recently launched London-based Ukrainian History Global Initiative, where she will serve as a trustee alongside her colleague, historian Timothy Snyder. 90... 90 international and Ukrainian historians will come together in this multi-year undertaking to refocus the world's views on Ukraine's contribution to history and to wrest Ukraine's past from the shadow of Russian and Soviet narratives. And speaking of Russian narratives, tonight, as Ukraine fights on to save its independence and protect Europe, while pinning its hopes on sustainable military assistance from the West, Anne will speak to us not only about the necessity of a Ukrainian victory, but also the dangers posed to our Euro-Atlantic alliance by an, by an authoritarian menace that now threatens our own democracy. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome journalist, historian, and Pulitzer Prize winning truth teller, Ann Applebaum. I haven't done anything to deserve this. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for that unbelievably flattering introduction. Um, uh, this is a really special group and a special meeting and a special evening for me as well. Um, uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, you, are, uh, you are all gathered here tonight to pay honor to translators, to writers, um, to people who, tells, who tell fictional stories and true stories um, and describe reality and seek to convey um, you know, the, the, the truth of what's happening in Ukraine and around the world to everybody is one of the most important things that you can do. And I think to have an, an incredible dinner like this one um, in honor of that is, um, and, and to, for me to be invited to speak here is really a very great honor. So thank you so much. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to begin with, um, with where um, the Ukrainian foreign minister began, which is a reminder again that we are, we are 90 years ago, 90 years away from one of the greatest tragedies in European history. Um, remind, remember, in the autumn of 1932, the Soviet Politburo, you know, the elite leadership of the Soviet Communist Party, knowingly took a series of decisions that widened and deepened the famine in the Ukrainian countryside. There was a chaos all over the Soviet Union. There was disaster because of collectivization. But very specifically, in Ukraine, they increased the state's demand for food. They blacklisted Ukrainian farms and villages. They refused to halt the export of grain. Um, which continued all through that year. They prohibited Ukrainian peasants from traveling to Russia in search of food. They blocked roads between the countryside and the cities. You know, at the height of the crisis, they organized teams of policemen and party activists uh, who, were, who were themselves motivated by hunger um, and, and fear and a decade of hateful and conspiratorial rhetoric. Um, to go into peasant households, to go from home to home, and to take everything edible out of their houses. Think about what that meant. You know, potatoes and beets and squash and, you know, peas and anything people had in their ovens and anything in their cupboards. And they took farm animals and they took pets and sometimes they took money and clothes. And this was a, it was a deliberate organized state theft of food and a deliberate, with the deliberate intention of to, to make sure that people died. And as you know, the result was a catastrophe. Within weeks of Stalin's orders, um, Ukrainians in the countryside began eating horses and dogs and cats and rats, and they ate the bark of oak trees, and they ate dandelions and acorns, and they killed crows and pigeons and sparrows. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a quote from somebody I, who's a, a, a woman who was a child at the time who remembered, um, frogs didn't last long because people caught them all, and all the cats were eaten and the pigeons, and people ate everything, and I imagined the scent of delicious food as we ate weeds and beets. And I'm telling you those stories again now. I know that everybody in this room at least knows them and has heard them before, because I also want, I, want to, I want us to remember that for a long time now, a long time, we thought that couldn't happen again. You know, that this was, a, this was a piece of history that belonged to the distant past. You know, it was like World War II, it was the Holocaust, the Holodomor belonged to a different era. Um, you know, it, it was an era in which uh, borders could be shut, news could be banned, um, censorship could be complete. Um, a, a, a terrible famine like the one that took place in Ukraine, a deliberate and orchestrated famine, could be hidden from the rest of the world. And we thought that that couldn't happen again because in the, in the, in the 90 years since then, we had created a different set of system, a different system in the world. Sometimes it's called a system of international law. Um, sometimes it's called the rules-based order. Um, 
you know, you know, what do we mean by that? We mean a system of norms and values, and of course, sometimes it describes how the world ought to work and not how it actually worked. Um, but, but we did build, in the aftermath of the Second World War, a kind of aspirational world order that was transcribed into a series of documents, the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the UN Genocide Convention, the Geneva Convention on, on the Laws of War. And in the, in, the, in the seven decades, actually, since those were written, you know, sometimes those documents were ignored. You know, the UN Genocide Convention did not stop the genocide in Rwanda, uh, the Geneva Conventions didn't stop the Vietnamese from torturing American prisoners of war or Americans from torturing Iraqi prisoners of war. Um, signatories of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights included known violators of human rights and so on. Nevertheless, these documents did influence real behavior in the real world. So Soviet dissidents used to embarrass their governments by talking about treaties that the Kremlin had signed and didn't respect. And so even when fighting brutal or colonial wars, countries that had signed these treaties on laws of war, for example, tried to abide by them. So avoiding civilian casualties or, um, or they felt remorseful when they failed to do so. And so actually the Americans who mistreated Iraqi prisoner of, wars, of war were court-martialed and convicted and sentenced to time in military prisons. You know, the pr British continue to agonize over the past behavior of their soldiers in Northern Ireland. The French over there is in Algeria. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, and this, it has something in common with Hamas's surprise attack on Israeli civilians last October, um, is a blatant rejection of that rules-based world order, and it heralds something new. Um, uh, it is a, it is, and more than that, I would say it is an intentional, one of the reasons why it happened, and we all know, again, this is a room in which I don't have to tell people about the history of the Russian Empire, or I don't have to tell you, you know, that, that you know, about Putin's desire to reconstruct, um, you know, some vision of, of, of Peter the Great's, uh, Peter the Great's Russia. Um, but in addition to that, the, the function of the attack was to undermine those rules, to say, we don't care about them anymore, we, and, and, and to do so blatantly. So Russia deploys a sophisticated, militarized, modern form of terrorism, and it does not feel apologetic or embarrassed about this at all. So you know, terrorists, by definition, are not fighting conventional wars, and they do not obey the laws of war. So instead, they deliberately create fear and chaos among civilian populations. And so although terrorist tactics are usually associated in the past with small revolutionary movements or clandestine groups, terrorism is now openly part of the way that Russia fights wars. So although it is a sovereign state, permanent member of the UN Security Council, Russia first began deliberately hitting civilian targets in Syria in 2015. Um, including power stations, water plants, and above all, hospitals and medical facilities. Um, there were 25 of them, for example, in, in, the month, in a single month in 2019. And these attacks were unquestionably war crimes, and those who chose the targets knew they were war crimes. Um, some of those hospitals had even shared their coordinates with the UN in order to avoid being targeted. And it's thought that Russia got those coordinates from its UN contacts. Um, so Russia, the Russian and Syrian government were deliberately looking for hospitals and trying to hit them. In Ukraine, Russia has once again used artillery, cruise missiles, drones, um, including Iranian drones, to hit an even wider range of civilian targets, houses and apartment buildings, churches, restaurants, ports, grain silos, you know, you name it. Um, you know, not that long ago, Russian missiles hit a shop and cafe in the small village of Hroza, killing more than 50 people. Why? This kind of strike had no conventional military justification. The point is to create pain and cause civilian deaths and sow disruption and nothing else. And Russian propagandists, in the wake of that attack, praised the destruction and called for more. They said, we should wait for the right moment and cause a migration crisis for Europe with a new influx of Ukrainians. So to explain why a permanent member of the UN Security Council has adopted this kind of behavior, I, you know, of course we can start with the nature of Russia itself. You know, this is, 
this is part of Putin's domestic politics. So he's reestablishing a totalitarian dictatorship in Russia, an authoritarian regime. Um, the brutality that he uses abroad is also intended as a message to Russians at home. You can't defeat me. You can't remove me. Um, but in addition to that, you know, there, there's, there's more blame to go around um, because, in fact, the rules-based order, which, as I said, has always been aspirational, has actually, had actually been in trouble for a long time. And, and so another piece of what Russia is doing is aligning itself with other autocracies who also have an interest in undermining this order. You know, if the rules are gone for Russia, they're gone for everybody. You know, so autocracies led by China, for example, have been seeking to undermine or remove uh, the language about human rights and the rule of law from international forums for years, replacing it with the language of sovereignty. Actually, the Chinese also have this expression we need a win-win solution, which sounds very nice. And what win-win means is that you don't criticize us and we won't criticize you, and human rights are off the table and, and, we, and we move on. Um, you know, not that this is just a matter of language. You know, the Chinese have carried out atrocities against their Uyghur minority um, so far with impunity. They openly conducted a successful assault on the rights of the population of Hong Kong. Um, they and others have also indulged in deliberately provocative behavior um, designed to mock the rule of law outside of their own borders. So Belarus got away with forcing an Irish-owned airplane to land in Minsk um, and kidnapping one of its citizens who was aboard. Um, Russia has organized the murder of its citizens in London and Washington and Berlin. Um, China kidnaps Chinese citizens abroad and brings them to Beijing. Um, and now the Indian government appears to have adopted this new norm as well to judge by recent behavior um, in Canada. Um, you know, democracies, including the United States, bear some of the blame for allowing this system to deteriorate as well, either for refusing to enforce anything resembling order when they could or for sometimes violating the rules themselves. I already spoke about um, torture during the war on Iraq. Um, but then also, you know, we can go through the list of recent American presidents. Barack Obama accused the Syrians of using some chemical weapons and then failed to do anything to stop them. You know, Donald Trump went out of his way to pardon American war criminals and continues to advocate extrajudicial murders, among other things, um, implying that the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, deserves to be executed. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu has indulged the most extreme voices in Israeli politics, um, including political figures who explicitly seek to undermine Israel's independent judiciary. You know, a member of his own party has called for the mass expulsion of Arabs even, even recently. Um, by, but by pointing this out, you know, or by noting that um, Israelis have also killed Palestinian civilians, I'm not excusing what Hamas did, or I'm just describing Israel's contribution to the deterioration of whatever norms remain. You know, add to that a UN that seems pre-programmed to appoint weak leaders, a European Union that still doesn't have a security policy or a defense policy, and you begin to see the bigger picture. So we are really now heading, thanks partly to Russia, into an era when there is no order, you know, rules-based or otherwise at all. Um, you know, during its lifetime, the aspirational rules-based world order and the international community that supported it were frequently mocked and maybe, maybe rightly so. You know, these kind of crocodile tears of statesmen, you know, who would express their profound concern when their unenforced rules were broken could be pretty unbearable. Um, you know, the hypocrisy about distant conflicts, you know, was, could be intolerable. Um, Russia's deputy defense minister recently parodied this kind of talk when he called for peace between Israel and Hamas based on recognized agreements, you know, as if Russia accepted any recognized agreements as a basis for peace in Ukraine. Um, but just like the also maybe soon to be outdated Pax Americana, you know, we might miss the Geneva Convention when it's gone. Um, the idea that, and the idea that it's not only gone, but that open brutality has once again become celebrated in international conflicts, you know, means that, you know, and means that there may be a long time that passes uh, before anything else uh, replaces it. Um, 
But I don't want to end on a, on a note of despair, because I think that the war um, and all of the events that have unfolded around us have taught us a valuable lesson. You know, we in, in, in Canada, in North America, in the United States, in Europe, have really been sleepwalking for a long time, because this deterioration had been going on for many years. Um, and we, we allowed it to happen. We knew it was happening. Um, but it didn't seem to touch us, and it didn't feel real. Um, this war is, should be the wake-up call. You know, this, is, this is a direct attack on the ideals of democracy. It's a direct attack on you know, the rules of the UN. It's a direct attack on the idea that there are laws of war, or that there are any laws at all, or that there is such a thing as a rule of law. And we should understand that and begin to prepare. So it's a warning that we need to prepare for a different future, to live um, in a different world, one where there are no rules and where we may have to look for new, um, new ways of doing diplomacy, new ways of organizing ourselves, new ways of um, creating alliances um, to push back against this increasingly integrated world of autocracy. Um, let me um, return to where I began which is with my appreciation for the work of people in this room, the efforts that you make uh, by sponsoring literature and scholarship to further the cause of Ukrainian independence and Ukrainian sovereignty and Ukrainian democracy, because we, we now know that all of these things require a broader lens. You know, Ukraine will only be safe when we end the impunity that is enjoyed by, enjoyed by Russia, by China, by Belarus, by Iran, and when we really mobilize the democratic world to understand that its own values, our values, are really what's at stake. Um, and it's through writing, it's through speaking, it's through the civic engagement that I know so many of you are involved in, through this you know, incredible list of organizations that you're um, that, that, that Mr. Peterson was contributing to um, through the many, you know, there are many people in this room who've been part of public life. You were MPs, um, you run organizations. It is through your involvement and engagement that we keep these, um, these ideas alive and, we, and, we, um, and we, we, we further the knowledge of what's happening, you know, in our, in our society. Um, so let me finish with this wish, which is the wish that people in this room go on to sponsor the new thinkers and the new writers uh, and the new generation of Ukrainian and Western leaders who will find a way to forge a new world to replace the one that's disappearing. Thank you. <laughs>